Hello and welcome to another episode of the Iraqi Nutrition Podcast. I'm your host, Juma Iraqi, and today I am joined by Dr. James Hoffman, which I've been wanting to bring on the show for a very long time. And finally, uh, we found enough time to, to get you on. James, how are you doing today? I'm doing great. Thanks for having me on. It's always a pleasure. Thank you. So um, before we start, I just want to mention that this podcast is available on, on YouTube in video format. But if you want to listen to it in audio format, you can find it on iTunes, Stitcher and also SoundCloud. So, James, we are going to talk about how to optimize recovery today. And I know you've um, recently published a great book on this topic. But uh, bef you. before we start... Could you give us a, a brief introduction about yourself? Yeah, for sure. So uh, I'm James Hoffman. I have a PhD in sport physiology, which I got from the East uh, Tennessee State University under Mike Stone and Dr. Bill Sands. I grew up in Chicago, Illinois. That's where I did my undergraduate and master's work. And I do all sorts of stuff. I'm a man of many talents. I've studied sled pushing with rugby guys. I've studied recovery. I've studied high intensity interval training and cyclists all sorts of stuff so i love everything sports i love uh i love my cat i love video games i love dungeons and dragons i do it all i do all sorts of crazy shit i'm all over the place <laughs> so what type of uh sports have you been involved in yourself yeah for i did uh man i've done so many uh but i've done basketball i wrestled for a very long time i got into rugby later on which i really really loved i did american football I've done martial arts of other types, like I did Shotokan, and I've been uh, learning a little bit of Muay Thai lately, not competitively. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I love, you know, I, I, I don't tie onto one thing too much. I love shooting sports, like I love to shoot guns, like I just love it all. I always like to train, I like to have something to train for, or something to at least think about training for, even if I don't compete, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, and you, you guys are lucky because you have like, uh, a lot of sports that you can get involved in 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 the in the states like compared to here where you either play soccer or you get involved in some cross country skiing or something like right. that so <laughs> yeah we are fortunate we have you you pick it we have it yeah yeah but soccer is actually quite big in the states as well right it's really big and yeah. we act, and I actually didn't realize we I mean we have a lot of semi professional teams uh here in the states and like when I was in Philadelphia the, the a lot of the players were making six figures mm -hmm. for playing semi pro out there which I had no idea cuz I had a student who was interning uh I was supervising his internship and I was asking him some questions. He was doing strength, their strength conditioning stuff and I was like, "Okay, so you know, do a lot of these guys have other jobs?" And he was like, "No. They just get, you know, they make like 100 grand just playing on the team." I was like, "What?" They make six figures just playing on their uh, semi-pro team. So it's actually very popular. Uh, it's certainly more popular, I think, at least on the professional level than rugby. But rugby's coming up. Uh, and lacrosse is also very popular. Yeah. Yeah. R rugby is actually quite popular in, in the UK. Uh, but, like, soccer is a whole different game when it comes to, whole like... Level. Yeah, it's a whole other level when it comes to... Uh, the professionalism and also the money that's involved like if you go back like 20 years you would pay like 20 million pounds for a soccer play and that would be like a massive amount of money and now it's like now it's like nothing like you get like these fringe players in your squad which which uh, cost you like 20 25 and if you want to like bring in a superstar you have to like pay up to a hundred million pounds just to get uh, get the player yeah soccer is crazy you know it's uh, it's one that i never personally got into but i can appreciate like how popular it is and it's like um it's like for us it's like american football where it's there's just so much money that goes into it it's crazy mm -hmm. yeah all right james so we're gonna talk about uh, optimizing recovery and Ooh, to get uh you know about that, yeah? <laughs> so to get the thing started, uh, let's talk about why recovery is important. Yeah, recovery is an interesting uh, field of study. This is one of these uh, things that uh, like Mike and I started working on this book, I want to say like two years ago, because uh, in our 
in our business, we were getting people who were saying like, oh, I'm spending a lot of time doing, you know, I'm going to the crowd tube or I'm going to the massage place or I'm getting, uh, you know, what's it called? Cupping or I'm getting like needles done. And they would ask us a lot of questions on that. And I'd always be like, man, this is like st- stupid. Like you're, you're asking me these advanced strategies and uh, you're not doing the basic stuff, right? I was like, I know that certain things are really important, right? Like sleep and stress management. And so we started kind of like saying like, okay, enough is enough, right? We know that not all of these things are created equally, right? Just like we did with the nutrition stuff several years ago, where we said, okay, enough with like the nutrient timing, enough with the supplements, like we got to put a hierarchy to these things, because they're not all weighted equally. And recovery is a really interesting one, because when you think about it, the whole world is trying to kill you at all times, right? That's what entropy is all about. Everything is trying to destroy you. So your goal in life is to stay around as long as you can, and that requires a lot of stress recovery type interactions, right? That could be from training, or it could be from biological system standpoint, where it's like, okay, I encountered a stressor, it really set me off for a few days, I need to get back to normal. So the study of recovery for training purposes really deals with how do we deal with the, the highly catabolic and stressful nature of training, right? You go forth, you go do some overload training. If you actually don't take time or take steps to promote your recovery, you'll actually just get worse over time. Why? Because training is just a stressor. It adds a lot of fatigue. It uh, wreaks havoc internally on your body. And if you just keep training and don't actually spend any time trying to recover from that training, your performance goes down and you get worse. And we can see things like rhabdomyolysis and overreaching, overtraining, all that nasty stuff. So obviously we want to train hard because we want to get better, but there's that recovery component where you can't keep training hard unless you take steps to alleviate some of that training fatigue every now and again. The other part of the equation is you want to get better, right? You don't just train to be where you were. You're training so that you can be bigger, stronger, faster, more fatigue resistant, better looking naked than you were before, all of those things. So one of the problems that we have is that we can have recovery without adaptation, but we don't get much adaptation without recovery. So that makes recovery a very, very worthwhile thing to study because most of us are training for the purposes of promoting adaptation in some way. So how do we do that? Well, we have to actually ensure that adequate recovery is happening so we can actually have some of the best adaptive potential from our training and, of course, stay alive on the earth as long as possible. Excellent. Now, I know in the book that you wrote that you have um, a hierarchy of... um recovery. Could you walk us through that? Yeah, absolutely. So kind of like what we had just mentioned, we said, you know, not all of these things are created equal. So a lot of people, when they start thinking about recovery, and I've said this many, many times, and I'm going to keep saying it again. The first thing they do is they say, what should I add to what I'm currently doing to try and promote recovery? And what we're saying is that that might not be the best strategy. In fact, the best strategy might be to reevaluate what you're currently doing and seeing if you're doing a good job on some really basic fundamental things. So we made a big hierarchy and we said, you know, not all these things are created equal and we can run through each one a little bit. So this is kind of a funny story. So at the base of the pyramid, we see training within your MRV or what Mike and I like to call the volume landmarks. So when we were writing this book, we kept coming back to this idea of like, okay, there's only so much training that you can do and actually recover from. And we actually started piecemealing this idea of the volume landmarks together throughout this time. And we ended up having, you know, this huge amount of content just about things like MRV, MAV, MEV, all that stuff. And we said, well, God damn, why don't we actually just make this a whole separate book because we already have enough content filling up this recovery book on the volume landmark. So it was kind of funny that uh, we started with the recovery book and then throughout the process, we ended up spitting out this, uh, <laughs> the volume landmarks book because there was so much to say about that. So kind of the take home, If you haven't seen that particular book, you know, there's not much you can do if you are exceeding the boundaries of what you can recover from in terms of your total training volume, right? And that can come from a variety of sources. It can come from what you're doing in the gym in terms of your resistance training, any of the cardio stuff that you're doing, any of your sport-related training. All of that stuff gets factored in. So there's there's a point of no return which nothing can save you from, right? So we know that if you train up to a point you can recover from, uh, there's also a point where you can train and recover and stop making adaptations. There's a separate point where you can train and uh, not recover anymore, right? So 
training within your MRV, training within your volume landmarks was the essential step. It is the first prerequisite thing that we must address before we can even discuss anything else because everything after that is insufficiently powerful to ameliorate this effect. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. So like if you're overtraining, there's no pill, there's no magic amount of sleep, there's no food, there's no amount of heroin or cocaine you can do to get around it, right? That's the problem. So it's definitely the first choke point where we say you have to understand what are the minimum and maximum values of training that you yourself can tolerate on an individual level. So that's kind of a prerequisite step, right? We can't really address, address anything else uh, before that. Once we have established those things and we say, I have a pretty good idea of how much training I can do from all my different sources, now we can start looking into some of the actual specific recovery modalities. And we wanted to break it down in a, in a meaningful and useful way. And so the next one we see in our hierarchy is what we have called passive recovery methods, which basically includes things like sleep, relaxation, naps, stress management, uh, and things along those nature. What we have found is that outside of training within your MRV, right, this is the next choke point, right? There's nothing you can do about not getting enough sleep and not managing your stressors well. After that, like there's no drinks, there's no amount of deloading or light days that you can take, there's no amount of therapy or compressive garments that you can wear to get around that. So that was the next choke point for us. So within passive recovery, we said, you know what? Sleep, 100%, you cannot get around it. It's been well documented for a variety of different things and it's absolutely true in recovering from training. You gotta get enough sleep, which of course is variable from person to person. After that, we wanna start looking at our lifestyle, right? How can we adopt a, a, a more beneficial lifestyle to meet the demands of training? And one of the things that really became probably the biggest reoccurring theme in the book and then in our field of study of, on, on recovery methods was this idea of relaxation and stress management, which I think is my favorite one to talk about because it's one that we take for granted and we give a lot of lip service to, but not a lot of people actually take the time to do it. So what is what are we actually talking about? So relaxation, stress management, let's start with relaxation. Essentially what we're trying to promote is getting somebody who is in an elevated or heightened physical or psychological state down to baseline or kind of their reduced resting physical and psych, uh, psychological state. So we're talking, we can look at things like heart rate, respiration. We can look at arousal levels, mood, affect, all those different things. What we're saying is, all right, you went and did some hard training. You got pumped up physically. You got pumped up psychologically. Now what I need to do is get you back to baseline. We need to start promoting a lot of our rest and digest mechanisms and get out of our fight or flight mechanisms. So that is probably after sleep, the most important one. And then what we were talking about a little bit before we, uh, on the, sh before the show was stress management. And that kind of is, a uh, kind of goes hand in hand with relaxation. But for what the big difference here with stress management is what we wanted to say is, you know, uh, it's, it's difficult to control your emotions, right? A lot of people will say like, Oh, stress management, you need to like control your emotions and not like get mad or not get anxious or not be sad. That's a big misnomer, right? Because things happen. Shit happens throughout the day. No way around it, right? Your kid barfs on the floor. Your, you know, PI like doesn't put you as first author on your paper. You son of a bitch. I should have been first author on that, right? Some weird shit's going to happen throughout the day. And inevitably, out of your control, you're going to respond to that. And that response is mostly chemical, right? You're going to be happy, sad, anxious, whatever. So you can't really control that. What you can control, however, is your behavior that follows. And what a lot of people get into the bad habit of doing is they'll encounter some stressor and then they'll let that manifest into like very unproductive behavior where they're anxious all day long, they're brooding, they're angry, they're letting it bother them for days on end, right? Somebody flips you the bird on the way to work and you're like, ah, oh, what? And you just let, you let it get under your skin. Stress management basically says, you have to be able to control your behavior and flush some of those things down the toilet and not let it bother you. Unfortunately, what we have found is that lifestyle stressors can accumulate with training stressors and they can have physical manifestations. Things like your sympathetic nervous system activity can start to go up. Things like your resting heart rate, catecholamine release will start to go up. Catabolic hormones will start to go up. All these nasty things, even when you're not exercising, right? And those things, unfortunately, directly butt heads with a lot of our anabolic processes. 
So we can't have or we can't maximize our anabolic effects if we have all this catabolic activity going on. And unfortunately, catabolic activity can be stimulated not only by training, but also by lifestyle stressors. So we said passive recovery, really, really big deal. And then the last one I think on there was um, just uh, total rest, right? Just taking a a non-exercise day every now and again. So that was our big one on there. We thought those were probably the most important after training within your MRV as we moved up in the pyramid, am I, you can stop me too if I'm rambling too much. We doing okay? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just continue. <laughs> okay, so if you ever want to slow me down, if you want to talk about anything, just let me know. I feel like I'm rambling. Okay. Um, the next couple we looked at, we were like, okay, so we said passive recovery, really well documented. Relaxation seems to be a common theme amongst many of the recovery modalities. Got that covered. So what comes next? We said, okay, we have active recovery and we have nutrition. Can we definitively say one is better than the other? And the answer we got was no. We cannot definitively say one is necessarily better than the other. There are elements of both which uh, cannot be replaced and are necessary, but it's hard to put a specific weight to some of these things. So we said next up in our pyramid was both active recovery and nutrition. They are equally weighted because we know that, for example, not getting enough calories – be it from carbohydrates, fats, proteins, whatever, will have a direct impact on your ability to maintain weight or have good exercise performances, all sorts of stuff. And likewise, you can take things like deloads once every you know mesocycle or so, and that can have a massive influence on your ability to bounce back into hard training after you've been tired for a little while. So with nutrition, we said, all right, a lot of the same stuff that we've been talking about before, calories, macros, most of the same kind of stuff that uh, you've probably heard us preaching about before. But we also said, hey, you know what? Nutrient timing was not a big deal for body composition. It actually is kind of a deal for recovery from training, uh, especially if you train multiple times per day or if you have multiple competitions kind of within the week. Food composition, hydration, supplements, less important later on. Um, So I think those have kind of been beaten to death. So one of the things that I like to, I just gonna glaze over that one for now. If we get into active recovery, We see some kind of interesting things start to happen. Active recovery was a tough one for us because we have um, a weird blend of things that have how effective they are, what is their efficacy, and then also kind of what is their applicability. And what we find with active recovery is that we have a weird blend between some of these things. So we tried to structure our active recovery hierarchy with things that were the most efficacious and the most applicable, and then kind of work our way down in terms of the compromise between those two things. So at the base, we have deloads. Deloads are incredibly effective at managing acute and chronic fatigue, and just about anybody can do it. You don't have to be an athlete. You don't have to be a bodybuilder. Everyone can benefit from taking a deload once per mesocycle, which, you know, once every four to six weeks or so, everyone benefits from that. So we put that one right at the base. It carries it carries a lot of weight for us because it does a lot of good stuff. Mesocycle and annual volume manipulations, that one's a mouthful. You can kind of just cross that out and write periodization if it makes a, makes more sense for some people. But basically what we're saying is throughout the year, you have to change up how much training volume you're doing. And you can achieve that a number of different ways. You can take something like a strength phase, which automatically brings your training volume down a little bit. You can take resensitization phases throughout the year. Or if you're like a more sporting person, you might actually have a progression, like a phase potentiated progression from like GPP to specific preparatory to competitive periods, which manages that for you. And you don't really have to think about it all that much. For those of us who are just training for health and physique, it's something that's worth noting. And basically the take home message there is like, you can't just go balls to the wall all the time. Every now and again, we have to pepper in some lower volume training periods to give the body a chance to heal and recover and alleviate some of that really, really gnarly long-term chronic accumulated fatigue. So on that one, just change it up every few months, right? We're saying take a lower volume training phase, take a strength phase, take a resensitization phase. Every one to three mesocycles or so, it will pay out big dividends in promoting long-term gains and managing long-term fatigue. Uh, Next up, we looked at active rest phases. Active rest phases are very, very powerful in terms of how much fatigue they can alleviate. Unfortunately, they're not as applicable because if you're just training for health like you and myself, like we we don't really do sports. We're just training to be strong, healthy people. Um, We don't really get – 
psychological burnout from doing that too much, right? There are, we have good and bad days like anybody else, but active rest phases are for when people are carrying a lot of baggage, right? This is when you've basically given up on doing your sport where you're just like, I don't want to do another double under or wall ball. I don't want to pick up another Atlas stone. I don't, I can't, I can't even look at it. The thought is making me sick. Like I, I, I'm over it. I'm over it. I don't want to deal with it anymore. Right. That's the time when we have to start thinking about active rest. And so Taking active rest, you know, for like two to three weeks at a time can really help alleviate both physical and psychological fatigue and stimulate desire to train and desire to compete again, which is very, very powerful. Unfortunately, like I said, uh, it's something that you might not even need to do. So its applicability is very low, especially if you're just training for, you know, health and fitness kind of stuff. So it's, it is powerful. Uh, its applicability is more limited to athletes only or people who are doing really, really hard uh, training and diet combination stuff. Uh, my favorite, which is unfortunately not very powerful, nor is it very applicable. Uh, actually, I take that back. It is, it's not very powerful. It is very applicable, but not applicable enough to compensate our uh, light sessions. Light sessions is one of my favorite ones. It's one of the easiest ways of managing kind of um, microcycle fatigue, like fatigue throughout the week. It's something where you basically just take a normal training day, chop it in half, make it what we call a light session, and you can really bounce back during the week when stressors have kind of accumulated in an unfavorable way. I would do this with my rugby players all the time. If we had like a two-day tournament where they were playing sevens or something, they would come to Monday's practice and they would be all beat up from all the rugby that they played. And we would just do a light session. It was wonderful. They would come in. They would do their normal warm-up stuff. We would do no contact. And it would only last for about an hour or so. We'd play some games, have some fun, work on some basic skills, send them home. They'd come back for Wednesday practice, re-energized, ready to have more productive, more normal rugby practices. You can do the same thing with uh, weight training sessions. You name it. You can do it really easy. I love light sessions. I think it's a really smart, strategic thing to do to have a couple light sessions planned every week. However, it's just not as powerful as doing something like a deload and you don't necessarily need to do it. Like you, uh, you can think of it like this, right? If you're designing a training program and you're trying to figure out, is my program going to fail having light sessions? Does it matter? Uh, it doesn't matter that much whether you have light sessions or not. It's definitely a benefit, but it's not going to cause your program to fail not having deloads in your program, that's a big deal, right? That's going to inevitably cause your program to fail at some point. So that's kind of why we have the hierarchy the way it is there. And then last on here, tapering is uh, very, very powerful, incredibly low applicability. And we actually, actually had it offset on our pyramid because it's a athletic technique only. People who are training for health and fitness don't even need to do this at all. It's only for competition specific uh, preparation. And even within that, only for probably the most important competitions that we're gonna see throughout that annual training plan. How are we doing? I, I feel like I'm just rambling on here. No, no, I think I it's like great. A I, I, crazy I, person. I, ha I have some follow up uh, questions that I've uh, written down. Like, let's take the first one uh, when you're talking about sure. deloads. Um, do you prefer to uh, use planned deloads or do you prefer them to be used when you actually start to feel fatigued and you actually need them? I like to use a combination of both. And so um, one of the things, and my fiance Mel, she made like this fantastic diagram, I couldn't have asked for a better one, where basically, generally we want to have pre-planned deloads as kind of the backbone of our training plan, right? But that doesn't mean that you cannot auto-regulate at the same time. Auto-regulation and taking light days and deloads when needed is very, very valuable. However, you do need to have a hard line when you decide to do that. So you have to have some evidence that says, you know what, I actually, I, I actually really need this deload right now. I'm not just having a bad day or I'm just feeling a little funky today. You know what I mean? So if you do that, so you might have a pre-planned deload. You do two or three weeks of hard training and you realize like, you know what? Damn, dude, I overreached prematurely. This is not what was supposed to happen. You can take an auto-regulated deload. And what I would do then is take the information, the data that you did from that training program where you said like, here's what I did. Feed that back into your pre-planned strategy. Say like, okay, well, I had my pre-planned strategy, but that failed me. But I have my auto-regulated thing that got me back on track. I need to adjust my pre-planned strategies based on what actually happened. So I say do both and let both of the, the data from both of those things drive your program. And it ends up being a win-win. A, a lot of people are kind of like on black and white where they're like, you you have planned deloads or you do 
uh, auto regulation. Why not both? Why not both? You, but the problem is you need to have a hard line. You need to have some evidence that says my athlete or myself is not in an appropriate training state based on what I have planned. And if you can identify markers in psychological markers, performance markers, physiological markers that can indicate that, then auto regulation can be very, very useful. But again, you need a hard line. Excellent. Now, I have a, another question regarding stress management. I remember um, two years ago, I used to have a, um, a company that I worked for where I needed to commute a lot. So I used to wake up early in the morning, take the train. It would take me an hour and a half and then work all day there and then take the train back, which also was an hour and a half. Uh, and what I remember was that on those days where I did this, like my sleep would be on point, my nutrition would be on point, and I wasn't really doing any physical work, like just sitting on the computer and punching numbers and doing stuff like that. And every day, every time I had those days, if I did a workout, they used to suck like really, really bad. I used to have like terrible workouts all the time. So my question is, is there anything uh, like some st like strategic wise you could do to um, reduce the stress before a training session, or is it better to do the training session and then focus on recovery after the session? Well, I think that's a great question. I think it depends on how negatively you feel the stress is impacting your training session. So, for example, when you said you were commuting, when you were on the computer, were you vehemently working the whole time? Like as soon as you got on the train, you flip open the laptop and you're doing emails and work and stuff, right? Mm -hmm. So that's a, that's a very productive use of that time in terms of your career. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, you are still expending a lot of psychological effort and energy, although you might not feel like it because you're just sitting on the computer doing what you normally would do anyway, but you're staying engaged, you're in a heightened aroused state psychologically, and it requires a lot of energy and concentration, right? So in that case, if you are feeling like, oh man, I'm, uh, by the time I get to my workout, I'm all, I'm worn down. Well, you've been working the whole time. Even though you were commuting, you were working on the train, you worked at work, you worked on the, you're working on the way back. What might be a good idea then is to maybe do some more, uh, like just what I would call more structured relaxation time where instead of working, you just watch a movie, you just catch up on your favorite shows, do something that's low stress. And, uh, you have to strike a balance there because you could probably make a very smart argument that says, well, I don't, uh, I, if I get stuff done on the train, that's less work that I have to do for that day at work. And that's a very smart argument. Uh, and if that is true, then maybe structure your day and where you have uh, some time at work where you actually just take 45 minute break. Uh, if you're caught up on all your work, at least for the moment, and just chill out for a little bit. Do the same thing. Relax. Listen to some music. Listen to your favorite podcast or watch Netflix. Any of those things. Uh, I think those are really good. If that's not an option and you, you have to work really hard all day and that workout comes up, there's not much you can do. And then what you should do is shift to focusing your recovery efforts uh, in the post-exercise recovery period and say like, okay, well, I've got to bust my balls all day. That's not going to change. That's just what my life is right now, and I can't change that. Totally cool. That means that after my workout is over, that is my planned relaxation time for the day, and I'm going to set aside an hour to eat a meal and do nothing, right? No wife, no kids, no research, no work, none of that shit. It's just my time to do what I want. If I want to build a ship in a bottle, fine. If I want to watch anime or read graphic novels, fine. I'm not going to do work emails. I'm not going to do texts. Only stuff that I want to do and stuff that's going to make me feel good. That's the way I would go about it. Like, obviously, you want your training session to go well, but realistically, based on people's commitments, they have work, they have family, they might not always be able to train at the most ideal time. If that is the case, focus your recovery efforts in the post exercise time. Excellent. Now, I like it, it automatically. Uh was that I, I did just lighter session on that day because I started to see a pattern that every time I was commuting, like I didn't have anything in the tank, even though I was like using a huge amount of caffeine, like nothing, like you didn't, I didn't have any uh, power at all in training. So the, the strategy with doing lighter training session, uh, I, did a, I did apply that on those days just because I didn't see any other options. That's a smart thing to do too. Like if you know there's a couple of days in the week that are just ball-bustingly hard, take light sessions on those days. Mm -hmm. That's a that 
I couldn't have said it better myself. That's an excellent strategy. I think that's golden. And then when you have days that aren't as hard, those are your really hard training days. Mm -hmm. All right, moving on to the next question. Um, regarding stress, we've talked about um, how stress can affect uh, uh, recovery, but are there any specific times where stress management might be more important to optimize recovery and now we're talking about for for like optimizing recovery for training you know it's a it's a funny question because mm -hmm. a lot of the times that we see people who are having a hard time with stress management we actually tell them to stop training and stop dieting as hard that's one of the first things that we do believe mm -hmm. it or not there are more important things in life than doing this vanity diet and training shit right and this is coming from a guy who's got a phd in dieting Right. So what we like to tell people is stress management's a real thing, right? It's going to lower your MRV if it's done poorly, and it's going to decrease the potential for gains as a result. So if you are in a point in your life where training hard and being incredibly strict and rigid on your diet is realistically not feasible, there's no shame in that. There's nothing wrong with that, right? That's perfectly okay. For like, for example, you yourself, I know you're working on three studies, you got kids at home, you're trying to do all this other stuff right now. It might not be the best time in the world to try and be hitting big PRs or trying to lose 5% body fat, right? There's no shame in that game. And so what we like to tell people at RP, well, they'll say like, I got a wedding going on, my grandma died, my dog is eating my cat as we speak right now. You don't need to be dieting right now. Push it back. Do maintenance, take a strength phase, right? A real low volume strength, like a strength phase, do maintenance dieting, and then focus on your focus your recovery efforts on stress management in your life stressors, right? It's not your training stressors that you need to worry about. What you need to focus on is managing your life stressors. And that is perfectly okay. You know, for the most part, if you can do normal, hard overload training and you don't feel uh, inhibited, stress management is pretty easy going for throughout the day. All, all you have to think about is not getting overly worked up or not allowing stuff to get under your skin. But if you are constantly stressed out and you have other things on your mind which are then impeding you from having productive workouts, that's when you need to think about stress management on a deeper level. And one of the first steps is actually just backing down on your diet and training because it's unrealistic to think that you can add life stressors and maintain the same level of training that you were doing previously. That is an unrealistic expectation. And so it's a hard thing to convey to people because they think it's like an ego thing where it's like, oh, bro, you're wussing out. Like, oh, you, you're just being a little pansy about it, right? That's not, the, that's not what we're saying, right? What we say is there is a, a good times in your life to focus on diet and training. And there are less good or less productive times. When you have a lot of stuff going on, when you are already struggling with stress management, put diet and training on the back burner for a little bit until your life is stable. And then go back to it when things are smooth and going well. Excellent. I think that's a, that's a great point because a lot of people, when they think, think about recovery, they only like they might be sleeping enough, they might be eating well, but I don't think a lot of people pay uh, enough attention to stressors that they have in uh, in life. Absolutely, and those things accumulate. Uh, one of the things that we, we try to make really clear is people just think about training stress, right? Where they're like, oh, I did a hard workout, right? But all of those things, add in like how's your relationships with your significant other how is your family doing what's your work life like how much sleep are you getting right how are you working on a big project at work are you worried about getting fired all of those things right accumulate stressors and those things have uh, uh, psycho uh, I forgot what the word is I'm drawing a blank but anyways those psychological stressors end up having physical manifestations later on which can impact your training and it's something that is worth thinking about absolutely excellent now, uh, I know uh, you mentioned that uh, in the pyramid, like one of the least important things were nutrient timing and, uh, and, and supplements. Uh, regarding supplements, is there anything on the market that's been shown to actually have a, a benefit for, uh, for recovery? Only the most simple things, things like carbohydrates and proteins. Everything else, not really. Not really at all. So it's one of those funny things where people will say like, check out this new recovery drink, right? And you look at the food label, it has no calories, 
no carbs, nothing. It does not promote recovery in any meaningful way that nothing that like a, <clears throat> there's the first one, excuse me, nothing that like a multivitamin or uh, having enough vegetables in your daily life doesn't already do. You know what I'm saying? So a lot of that is just total scam nonsense. So if you're looking at something and it's like, oh, here's this like funny recovery supplement, if it doesn't have a significant amount of calories, first of all, and then within the calories, you know, some amount of carbohydrate and protein, it's probably not doing anything worth your while. I've actually seen some that have stimulants in them where it's like, try this drink for recovery and it's just full of stimulants. That's the opposite of recovery. That's stimulating a stress response, right? It's a catabolic effect, uh, which is good for training, bad for recovery. So uh, most of that stuff is just scam nonsense. Um, nutrient timing is one that we actually kind of throw a bone for recovery. We say for recovery purposes, it might be worth your time. For body composition, it's it's mostly not worth your time. Um, and supplements for both categories are basically like, it's kind of like uh, if you're trying to build a car, it's like trying to figure out which uh, bobblehead to put on your on your dashboard in your car, right? Mm-hmm. Not the engine, not the transmission, not the radio, not even the paint color, not the tires, the bobblehead that you want in your car. It's very unimportant. Mm-hmm. Now, um, you, like how uh, I just found a, a follow-up question. How would, um, if you're already stressed and you think uh, I need something to give me a boost of energy so you take an espresso shot or caffeine pill or drink energy how would that affect you would that like you would get maybe instant energy there and then but in the long term how would that affect your recovery yeah so from an energy standpoint it's good right it can give you a little boost when you need a little boost and that's fine right from a recovery standpoint it's bad Caffeine and other stimulants like coffee and, and, and all that stuff, uh, it's actually stimulating that same stress response. It's stimulating a uh, catabolic energy producing response, which is again is good for getting up and, and going about your day. In the long term, it is bad. So there's two things to consider. A, the cellular response to taking stimulants is very, very similar to fight or flight response. It's inherently catabolic, right? Boom. The other problem with the stimulants is that it actually can mask accumulated fatigue and stress because it makes you feel better, right? So it's a psychological benefit where you actually feel like, oh, I feel energized, I feel good. What that can do is start to mask the underlying accumulation of fatigue where you you feel better than you actually are. That's the problem. So you're kind of, it's like a false positive. You know what I mean? We're like, I feel better, but you're actually still shitty. You need to actually focus on some recovery time. So it's it's fine. It's really probably only an issue for people who are heavy, heavy, heavy into the stimulant, you know, use where they're drinking, you know, multiple, uh, espressos, multiple cups, uh, excuse me, pots of coffee per day, like multiple energy drinks, multiple pump up drinks. That's where it kind of can become more tangibly negative for recovery, but normal use. Like if you have a couple espresso shots, you have a couple cups of coffee, a monster every day, probably not a big deal. Excellent. Now, moving on to the next question regarding doing too much, like if you focus too much, because when you're training, you're um, creating a stimulus and then you want that stimulus to further lead to an adaptation. So if you're doing too much uh, to optimize recovery, can that potentially have a negative effect on the training adaptations? Oh, yeah, that's an awesome question. So essentially what we see in this situation is like an over-reliance on fatigue management. So when we're looking at recovery strategies, we're kind of trying to strike a, an, a the most productive balance between the overload principle and the fatigue management principle. And I have seen both ends of the spectrum. Like everybody's seen the overly aggressive coach, right, who makes their athletes do 10 by 10 and everything, and then they're doing track sprints until they barf and like all these crazy workouts, right? But – On the other hand, you can also see people being overly conservative on their workouts where they don't actually train enough or don't do enough overload training and they're really not making any progress. So on the, uh, the, on that end of the spectrum, what we can see is not training enough. So not, so this again goes back to the volume landmark. So the volume landmarks includes the maximal end, the MRV. It also includes the minimal ends, like the maintenance volume and the minimum effective volume. So if you're not actually at the minimum effective volume and moving through upwards towards MRV, the funny thing is 
recoverability is not a limiting factor. The amount of training that you're doing is the limiting factor, right? So in this case, if you're overly conservative, focusing too much on fatigue management, uh, recoverability is not a limiting factor to you becoming a better athlete. You just need to train more. You need to train more and train harder. So we can see both ends of the spectrum. And that that was um, that was one of the reasons why we were like, we need to put together a system, some uh, a vocabulary to describe this because that's what the volume landmarks basically tries to outline, what we call dose-response relationships where it's like, here's the minimum I need to do, here's the maximum that I can do, I probably need to be somewhere in between there. So if you're below the minimum, it doesn't matter what recovery stuff you do. If you can do all the sleep, all the nutrition, you're just not training hard enough, right? If you're training too hard, you have the opposite problem where it's like, well, there's no amount of sleep or nutrition or light days that's going to fix this. you got to back off. So it can absolutely become a problem just in the sense that they're, they're not producing enough overload and they're just not going to get better over time. Excellent. Now, to wrap this up with the final question, what would be your take-home message on this topic? Oh, man. There's so many things I would like to say. Well, first off, right – Keep in mind, there's a hierarchy of things, right? So a lot of people, the first thing they want to jump to is doing like the massage, the compression sleeves, the heat, the cold, the ice bath, the contrast, right? Those things are absolutely useful, but their effect size, how big the effect is, is relatively small. And their use is more situational, right? What you need to focus on is adopting your lifestyle to the rigors of training. And what that usually means is hitting the big ticket items like are you getting enough sleep? Are you chronically stressed out all the time? Do you deload every now and again or do you do the same high volume workouts all the time, right? These are the big ticket items. Like if you're using periodization, check. If you're using deload, stuff like that, check. If you're getting enough calories and macros, check. You know, the thing is, man, all these things that I'm describing that are effective, they're hard, right? It's hard. You've got to do math. You have to sit there and diligently keep track of all this shit. No one wants to figure out the volume landmarks. Why? Because it's going to take you like a year of trial and error to figure out all this shit. And it's going to be a lot of data collection, a lot of logs and a lot of analysis, right? Same thing with calories, macros, right? No one wants to sit there and measure their body weight and how much, you know, keep a food log and look at their MyFitnessPal. It's a lot of work. No one wants to track their sleep and how much volume they're doing throughout the year. All that stuff is a lot of work, but it's the most bang for your buck, right? Everyone wants to go around that and find the quick fix. There's no quick fix here, right? In order to promote some of the best recovery adaptive strategies, you got to do the basic stuff and the basic stuff works really, really well. So there's no, there's no supplement. There's no massage. There's no sleeve or ice bath or therapy or voodoo witch doctor shit. You name it. You can't go and do it in one day and it's going to fix everything, right? What we're talking about with recovery is adopting your lifestyle to the rigors of training. That means you have to make many, 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 many small changes consistently all the time. It's not something where it's like, oh, I'm feeling shitty today. I'm going to try and find this like cool thing that's going to fix that. No, that means you've been doing a bad job with the basic stuff. You've probably been doing a bad job with your training, your nutrition, and then like things like passive recovery. So I think the take home message is right. Like don't get caught up in the minutia of things like trying to find massage or ice bath or, um, you know, what's it called? The needling stuff. Uh, I forgot what it's called. Um, cupping, all that stuff. All these things are, you know, not all of them, but many of these things are fads. They come and go, right? They, they come and go faster than we can prove them right or wrong. That's how bad it is in science, right? These things come and go. And by the time a study's already published, that thing's already gone, right? It's already too late. So don't be afraid to tackle the big ticket items, right? Get enough sleep. Relax throughout the day. Make sure you're keeping tabs on your calories and macros. Make sure you're training within your volume landmarks and you have some fatigue management strategies built into your program and can adopt your program as needed when fatigue gets too high. Those are the big things, man. After that, everything else is still useful, right? We're not saying that some of these things like uh, – compression and cold and stuff. We're not saying that they're not useful. They're just less useful and more situational. So it's kind of, again, if we go back to the car analogy, if I want a car, it's got to have a good engine, a good transmission and a good like frame to sit on. After that, I can start picking out what kind of interior I want, what kind of car, what kind of tires do I want? You know, do I want it leather, whatever. 
that's all fine tuning stuff after the fact. So take home message, man, I feel like a crazy person today. Maybe I had too much caffeine and I'm wigging out, <laughs> but don't get caught up in the minutia stuff, right? We made the hierarchy based on how effective these things are. Start working on the big ticket items and then work your way down to the smaller items. And by the time you get to the smaller items, you will have been doing a damn good job for a very long time. Excellent. I think that's a wrap, James. Thank you so much for taking the time to do this. I think this podcast is going to be uh, of very high value to a lot of people. Where can people find more information about you? Oh, well, thanks again for having me. This has been really fun. I feel like I was ranting like a crazy man. Um, you can find me on the Renaissance Periodization website. Uh, <coughs> excuse me. Mike and I do a weekly webinar on RP+. Plus. So if you guys uh, are interested in shooting us questions every week, we do a, we a live weekly webinar. And uh, we also have a podcast coming out called The Sports Scientist, which you can find on iTunes, SoundCloud, and on uh, YouTube. So plenty of stuff to find us at. Excellent. Once again, thank you so much, James. And um, I would love to bring you back uh, another time to talk about uh, another topic. Absolutely. It's been a blast. I would love to come back. Thank you so much. All right, James. Thank you so much and have a nice day. Take care.